In the last Bible study, we had looked at the mid-tribulation rapture or the rapture of the man-child as it's found in Revelation chapter 12. But as some of you would know, there was some problem with uh, the live stream. So a lot of people have written to me saying that they cannot see nor hear anything <clears throat> in that video. So today we decided that we will do this recording and try and upload it to our channel in YouTube and I pray that this Bible study would be a blessing to you. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5 it says and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and a child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So the child is caught up unto God and to his throne. This is clearly a rapture and this rapture takes place exactly in the middle of the tribulation. So this is the mid-trib rapture and it is represented by the rapture of the man-child. It's represented by the rapture of the man-child. Now Revelation chapter 12, if you study the entire book, <clears throat> you will see that Revelation chapter 12 is exactly in the middle of the tribulation. Now how do we know that? Now look at uh, verse 6 of Revelation 12. It says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had the place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. One thousand two hundred and sixty days is exactly forty-two months of thirty days uh, in each month. That's the biblical way of counting a month, thirty days. So that would be exactly three and a half years. You see, from the time this child is raptured or caught up to God, there are three and a half years left. And at the end of the three and a half years, uh, we know that uh, we come to the end of the tribulation or, the, you know, it leads to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Another thing is, this dragon, which is the devil, he fights with the angels of God, with Michael and his angels. And he is cast down to the earth. And we know from the study of scripture that the devil is cast down to the earth in the middle of the tribulation. And he's there on the earth in the second half of the tribulation, which is called the great tribulation. Right. So the devil is on the earth for three and a half years. So that's how we know that this rapture of the man child takes place in the very middle of the tribulation. Now, the problem is identifying who this woman is and who this man child is whom she brought forth who was caught up into the third heaven now the standard teaching of the roman catholic church as you might have guessed is that this woman who is mentioned in verse 1 let's look at uh, look at uh, chapter 12 of revelation and verse 1 and there appeared a great wonder in heaven a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars so this woman is clothed with the sun. Who is this woman? This woman is clothed with the sun and the moon, I think, is under her feet. And the moon under her feet and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. Upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. So the Roman Catholic Church says that this woman is Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus. That's the standard teaching. And of course, they say the man child who is born to her is naturally the Lord Jesus Christ. The Protestant teaching is not much better than this. The, the, the standard Protestant teaching on this is this, that the woman is the church. That's it. That's what they say. The woman is the church. Now, who is the man-child who is born? Well, they come up with all sorts of interpretations to it. But the woman, according to the standard Protestant teaching, is that she is the church. But you see, you need to rightly divide the word of truth. This woman is bang in the middle of the tribulation. What is she doing in the tribulation? If she is the church, then she is caught up before the tribulation begins. 
She has no business there in the middle of the tribulation. That's the first thing. Another thing is look at verse 17 of Revelation chapter 12, the last verse. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. What do you understand from that? It is very clear, firstly, that the woman is in the middle of the tribulation and the, uh, the, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. The remnant of a seed are those that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Salvation here very clearly is by works and faith. The commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Both are involved in the salvation of sinners in the tribulation. And if you go back and look at our other Bible studies, you will see that we have very clearly shown from the scriptures that salvation, the plan of salvation and the way God deals with mankind with regards to salvation is not always the same in all the ages. It's different. God dealt with certain people in a certain manner in a certain period of time. And if you do not uh, make that distinction between God's dealings from one age to another, you will mess up the scriptures. That's why it's very, very important for you to make this distinction and rightly divide the word of truth. This woman cannot be the church because the church does not go through the tribulation, not even halfway through the tribulation. The church goes up before the tribulation. Now the problem, as we have always been mentioning in our Bible studies, is this, that when Christians look at certain passages in the Bible which seem to be talking about uh, some sort of a rapture, they fail again to rightly divide the word of truth. There are some Christians who see that there is a pre-tribulation rapture. And they say this is the only rapture there is and there is no other rapture at all. There are some others who look at a mid-tribulation rapture like in Revelation chapter 12 or in the book of Hebrews. And they say there is only a mid-tribulation rapture. The church goes through halfway of the tribulation and then is caught up. There are other Christians who look at a post-tribulation rapture in the Bible like in Matthew 24 and Revelation chapter 14 and they say the church goes through the entire tribulation and then somewhere towards the end of, uh, end of the tribulation the church is caught up to meet the returning Lord Jesus Christ in the air. You see how they mess up the scriptures? They think the one that they have seen is the only one and they try to make the others fit in with the rapture that they believe in. For example, if Christians believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, they will make it look like the other two raptures mentioned in the Bible are actually talking about this rapture, when they are not. As I have been showing you in this Bible study, there is not just one, two or three raptures, there are seven raptures in the Bible. God is not limited just to a pre-tribulation rapture. The church is caught out in the pre-trib rapture. But then there is another group of people who are caught up in the middle of the tribulation and yet another group which is caught up at the end of the tribulation. Now this is rightly dividing the word of truth. And you don't try to make all scripture fit in or fall in line with what you believe. You don't do that. You change your beliefs and doctrines according to what the Bible says. And that's very, very important. So who is this woman? who is clothed with the sun, has the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. I think to any Bible student, this would be very obvious as to who this woman is. Look at Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37, we will read verses 9 through 10. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. Joseph is the one who is talking here and telling his brethren about the dream that he saw. Verse 10, And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? Jacob gives us the interpretation of the sun, moon and the stars. He says, will I, your mother and your brothers, the sun, the moon and the stars. Of course, the 11 stars are mentioned because Joseph himself is the 12th star. 
So this woman, according to scripture, comparing scripture with scripture, who has the sun, uh, who's clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet and 12 stars as a crown on her head, is none other than Israel. And that makes sense and fits in with the rest of the scripture. Because you see, in the tribulation, God is not dealing with the church. The church is not there on the earth. God is dealing with Israel. God is dealing with the Jews in the tribulation. Now, there are uh, a few other evidences given in the Bible by which we can certainly determine the identity of the woman as none other than Israel. Now, the first thing is, we have clearly seen that the sun, moon and stars are associated with Jacob, Rachel and the 12 sons of Israel or, or Jacob. So it's to do with Israel, nothing to do with Gentiles whatsoever. So this woman's identity is very clear. But let me still give you a few more evidences. Look at what happens to this woman in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. So thousand two hundred and sixty days. This woman is in the wilderness. From the time, uh, from this midpoint of the tribulation, this woman flees into the wilderness. Who is the, uh, uh, the woman who flees into the wilderness? Let us look at what the Bible says in other places. Uh, but before that, let's look at a couple more verses in Revelation chapter 12. Uh, look at verse 13 and 14. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. So, the, the dragon persecuted the woman who brought forth the man-child, and the woman was given two wings of a great eagle. That's very important that she might fly into the wilderness. She goes into the wilderness. How, she, how does she go into the wilderness? She is given the wings of an eagle that she may fly into the wilderness. Now, before I show you what this is all about, let me just pause for a moment and remind you of what Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 24. He said, when you see the abomination of desolation set up in the holy place, then let them which be in Judea and Jerusalem flee, he said. Let them flee. So the fleeing again is to do with Israel. It's very clear because Matthew 24, the Lord Jesus Christ is addressing Israel and he's specifically talking about what's going to happen to Israel in the tribulation. He says, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is set up right in the middle of the tribulation, when the dragon is cast down to the earth and the Antichrist is resurrected, comes back to life after he receives a deadly wound to the head. And there you have Satan incarnate on the earth and he persecutes the woman. He sets up the abomination of desolation and they have to flee into the wilderness. So it's very, very clear. There is no shadow of a doubt as to the identity of the woman. If you've been thinking this woman is uh, the church or Mary, it's absolutely wrong. They do not fit in there at all. So according to uh, what Jacob said, according to what the Lord Jesus Christ said, we can surely see that this woman is Israel. But let me give you a little more evidence on this. <coughs> Who is it that flees into the wilderness? According to Jesus, it's Israel. But let me reinforce that. Look at Hosea chapter 2. We'll read verses 14 and 15. Hosea chapter 2 verses 14 and 15. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. God is talking about his uh, estranged wife, Israel, in the book of Hosea. And he says, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness. It's going to and this whole chapter is talking about the tribulation there, most of it. Now look at... Uh, Verse 15, verse 15, 
And I will give her her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. We have always, uh, always been teaching this that Israel in the second half of the tribulation will be in the same position that she was in when she was brought up by God out of the land of Egypt and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. The only difference is there under the leadership of Moses they wandered for 40 long years in the wilderness. But here in the tribulation they will only wander in the wilderness for three and a half years. In fact they go into the wilderness to take refuge from the, uh, the great red dragon and the antichrist who persecute them. So it's very clear that God is saying I will allure her into the wilderness. In fact we know from studying other portions of scripture that just as God sustained Israel in the wilderness with manna from heaven and uh, with water from the rock, he's going to sustain them once again in the same manner. Give them manna from heaven and water from the rock. And that's how he's going to take care of them for three and a half years. And it's very clear in Hosea 2.14. He's going to allure her into the wilderness. Why is he going to do that? This will be the time when God will finally deal with Israel. And this is the time when all Israel will be saved. And when we say all Israel, those uh, whom uh, you know, God uh, appears to and speaks to them. And there are some who rebel and are destroyed. And the leftover, it would be a very small number. The leftover people from the uh, tribes of Israel will all be saved. Alright, so that's very clear. So who goes into the wilderness? It's Israel because God alludes her and brings her into the wilderness to deal with her. Now look at Deuteronomy 32 verses 10 through 12. Deuteronomy 32 verses 10 through 12. He found him in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. This is talking about when God brought Israel out of Egypt under the hand of Moses. He led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. Verse 11. <clears throat> As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings, so the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. You see the, uh, the allusion again to the wings of an eagle. We have read already in Revelation chapter 12 and Verse 14, that to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. When God brought Israel out of Egypt, he bore them upon his wings and he brought them into the wilderness. Once again, he's going to bear them upon his wings and bring them into the wilderness, lead them, guide them, instruct them right there in the second part of the tribulation. So there is absolutely no doubt as to who this woman is. This woman is Israel. Now the next question would be as to the identity of the man-child. Who is the man-child? In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5, once again it says, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Now the thing is, we know that the Bible clearly says that it is the Lord Jesus Christ who is going to rule the earth with the rod of iron. In fact, in Psalm 2, verses 8 and 9, this is what the Bible says. Look at Psalm 2, verses 8 and 9. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with the rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So immediately you would think that this should be a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Alright, so this man-child that we are talking about looks like uh, it's a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because this man-child is going to rule with a rod of iron. He's going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Now I would like to say that there is some evidence in the scriptures which might point to somebody else and not to the Lord Jesus Christ. Before you jump to any conclusion, listen to what I have to say and uh, 
examine the evidence that I'm going to present to you so that you may study it yourself and see what you could make of it. All right, so though it looks like the Lord Jesus Christ, it could be a reference to another deliverer or it could be a reference to a remnant of Israel. There are two possibilities. It is another individual who is going to be a future deliverer of Israel, who are at least who was supposed to be a, a deliverer of Israel. He's caught up to God. Or it could be a reference to a remnant of Israel. Okay, it could be a remnant of Israel. Now, let me show you evidences for both of this and then you can prayerfully decide as to who this man-child could be. So it could be a reference to another deliverer who would be helping Israel in the tribulation and an attempt would be made upon his life and God takes him out of the world to heaven. That's in the middle of the tribulation and that's the whole thing that we are looking at, the mid-tribulation rapture. Okay, it's a mid-tribulation rapture of the man-child. Now look at firstly what the Bible says about a man-child in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 11. 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 11. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Of course, this is a reference to Samuel. And she, his mother, is taking a vow that her son would be a Nazarite. All right. He would be, it would be a Nazarite. Like, uh, uh, so this man child that we are talking about could also be a Nazarite. Specially appointed by God for some special task that would be entrusted to him in the tribulation. Like Samuel, a prophet. This man, a Nazarite, could be a prophet or a leader whom God would use in the tribulation. Look at Isaiah 66 verses 7 through 8. Isaiah 66 verses 7 and 8. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. So again, you hear you have a proof that this man-child is from Israel. Because when uh, it says before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. And he goes on, who hath heard such a thing? <coughs> As soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Now, Isaiah 66, 7 and 8 could be talking about uh, two different things. It could be talking about an individual man-child in verse 7. And certainly in verse 8, it's talking about a remnant of Israel who are born again or not born again, but uh, you know, who are uh, brought forth. They are saved here in the second part of the tribulation. So it could be a reference to both. To an individual and to a group, to a remnant of Israel. So he is delivered, this man child is delivered before the travail and pain came. Verse 7 Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before the pains came, the pains are always uh, a type of the second half of the tribulation, which is the great tribulation. Okay, these are called pains and travail. Before the travail and the pains began, she brought forth a man-child. And according to Revelation 12, 5, this man-child is caught up to God. But in verse 8 again, as soon as Zion travailed, now this is talking about a little later. As soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Alright, so verse 7 is important. It's a reference to the man-child who is brought forth before the pains and the travail began. Now look at Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 6. Now I'm not uh, uh, going away from the subject here. I will try and tie it all together a little later. But 
Just bear with me and look at Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 6. Then said I, Our Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. Now, why did I choose this verse to read uh, in this connection? Because you see, Jeremiah was a man. He was a virgin. He was never married. And uh, he is a type of a man who is prophesying to Israel in the tribulation. Jeremiah, when he was prophesying to Israel, he was a type of a man prophesying to Israel in the tribulation. You can go back and look at the book of Jeremiah and read it and you will see uh, that he indeed is a type of a man who is prophesying to Israel. Remember, he is prophesying to Israel just before the king of Babylon, who is a type of the Antichrist, comes and takes Israel or Judah into captivity. The type is all there very clearly. So just before the captivity begins, Jeremiah begins to prophesy to Israel. Of course, he sees the captivity of Judah. All right, so he's a child here. He says, Lord, I'm a child. You know what God says to him? He says, don't say I'm a child. I will put my words in your mouth. I've called you to be a prophet to the nations. So this, the first thing I want you to keep in mind is that this man-child is not necessarily an infant. Because when you read that, that's the picture that you get in your mind. That it's an infant who is born and he's immediately caught up. The woman is not a literal woman. You see, it's not a single woman. It's Israel. And from Israel comes a prophet like Jeremiah who is prophesying to Israel. He may be a young man, a very young man. But still, he is someone who is appointed by God to preach to Israel, just like Jeremiah, who is a type of someone prophesying in the tribulation. And this man prophesies before the king of Babylon comes and takes Judah into captivity, a type of the second half of the tribulation. It's all there, brethren. It's all in there in the scriptures. Remember, Jeremiah is called a weeping prophet. He weeps for Israel. Why does he weep so much? Because he knows what's going to happen to, uh, to Judah when Nebuchadnezzar comes against it. So he warns the people. So it looks like this man-child could be someone who comes from Israel and in the first half of the tribulation, he preaches to Israel, he prophesies to Israel. And when an attempt is made upon his life, he is caught up to God, he is delivered. Another thing you must keep in mind is also this, that both Jeremiah and Paul were both uh, men who were not married and are both types of the 144,000 Jewish male virgins that the Bible talks about in Revelation chapter 7 and 14. 144,000, firstly they are Jews. Secondly, they are males. And thirdly, they are virgins. They have never known women. It's very clear there in the Bible. Why am I saying this? Because, as I've said, it could be a reference to an individual or it could even be a reference to a group of people. The man-child could be a reference to an individual or it could be a reference to a group of people or it could be a reference to both. And just like Jeremiah and Paul, these 144,000 Jewish male virgins preach in the first half of the tribulation the gospel of the kingdom. We don't have much place left here, so let me write here. The gospel of the kingdom of heaven. That Jesus Christ and John the Baptist preached. Not the gospel of the grace of God that uh, is found in the book of Acts from Acts chapter 8. That's not the gospel that we are talking about. It's, it's not the gospel that Paul preached. That's not the gospel uh, you know, that is preached here in the churches. The gospel of the grace of God. They preach the gospel of the kingdom and they preach especially in the first half of the tribulation. So there are all sorts of possibilities to consider. Look at Revelation chapter 14 and verse 4. Revelation chapter 14 and verse, uh, sorry, yeah, verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins, 
These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. <coughs> now we are told that this group of 144,000 Jews are raptured in the middle of the tribulation. How can we be sure about that? Revelation chapter 11 brings you to the, uh, to the end of a second account of the tribulation in the book of Revelation. There are four accounts of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Just as there are four accounts uh, of his first coming, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. There are four accounts given of the first coming of Jesus Christ. There are four accounts given of the second coming of Jesus Christ and these four accounts are found in Revelation. Like Revelation 6, 7, you find that you know you come to uh, through the entire tribulation once a full account of the tribulation is given. The seal judgments. And then the trumpet judgments take you once again through the tribulation. They give you another account of the tribulation from a different perspective. All right, so that is there again in 7, 8 and so on. When you come to chapter 11, you come to the end of the tribulation once again. Remember chapter 11 verse 15. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. It's talking about the second coming. So when you come to chapter 12, you come to the third account of the tribulation. That's right. So he, chapter 6 takes you through the tribulation once. The trumpet judgments take you from the middle of the tribulation to the end of the tribulation. Now once again, God rewinds and brings you back to the middle of the tribulation in Revelation chapter 12. So you are in the middle of the tribulation in Revelation chapter 12. All right. And that's when the man child is raptured. Now remember, these 144,000 Jewish male virgins are sealed at the beginning of the tribulation. In chapter 7 of the book of Revelation, they're sealed at the beginning of the tribulation. Before God hurts the earth, he seals them. So they are there on the earth for three and a half years. They are preaching, probably preaching the gospel of the kingdom to Israel and to the rest of the world. Just like the apostles did in Acts chapters 1 to 7 to Israel after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. All right. Then in chapter 13 of Revelation, you have the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is something that begins from the midpoint of the tribulation. It doesn't start at the beginning or it doesn't start somewhere towards the end. The abomination of desolation and the mark of the beast go together and they both start in the midpoint of the tribulation. So then in chapter 14, okay, it says in verse 1, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Uh, let's look at that chapter once. It says in the first verse that these hundred and forty-four thousand are on Mount Zion. This Mount Zion is not the earthly Mount Zion in Jerusalem. This Mount Zion is the heavenly Mount Zion that uh, the writer of Hebrews talks about, I think, in Hebrews chapter 12. We have not come to the mountain that, you know, is uh, burning with fire and where there is smoke and thunder and all that. He says we have come to the heavenly uh, city of, Ma uh, of Zion, of Zion, heavenly Mount Zion. How do you know that? Uh, in verse 3, and they sung as it were a new song before the throne. They are standing before the throne of God in the third heaven. Just like John stood before the throne of God in Revelation chapter 4. They have been caught up. And in Revelation 14, you are taken once again from the midpoint of the tribulation to the end of the tribulation. At least till uh, the post-tribulation rapture. And that's what happens. Now look at Revelation 14 and verse 9. Revelation 14 and verse 9. It says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image 
and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. And he goes on in verse 15. An angel flies in heaven and shouts with a, wo a loud voice and says, If any man worship the beast and his image or receive his mark, as I've told you, Worshipping of the, be uh, the, the image of the beast is the abomination of desolation, which begins in the midpoint of the tribulation. Go back and read Matthew 24, you will see that. And the, uh, the giving of the mark of the beast also begins simultaneously in the midpoint of the tribulation. So the angel is announcing and saying, from this point onwards, if any man takes the mark of the beast or worships his image, he will drink the cup of the wine of the wrath of God for the next three and a half years. So in Revelation 14, 9, you are still in the midpoint of the tribulation. But in Revelation 14 and verse 1, these people have already been caught up. They are in the third heaven in Mount Zion. In Revelation 7, they are on the earth and they are sealed in the forehead uh, by the angel. But in Revelation 14, verse 1, they are in the... In heaven, Revelation 14 verse 9, you're still in the midpoint of the tribulation. That tells you that this 144,000 people, Jewish males, 144,000 Jewish males are also caught up with uh, the man-child in the middle of the tribulation. Now, why am I saying all this? To show you that the man-child could be a reference not just to an individual savior, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a few minutes. But it could be a reference to this whole group of people, the 144,000 Jewish male virgins. They are Israelites, they are Jews. They are born to this woman who is Israel. They preach for three and a half years and then they are caught up. Now, I could be wrong on this. I'm not saying this dogmatically. I'm just showing you the possibility. And I'm showing you all the verses that could be referring to this mid-tribulation rapture of the man-child. All right, so it could be, firstly, as I've said, a reference to this group of Jews who are caught up in the middle of the tribulation. And it could be a reference to the 144,000 Jews, males. They are raptured. Another interesting thing in the Bible, which many Christians do not understand, is the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew chapter 25. Please turn to Matthew chapter 25. And it says in verse 1, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lambs and went forth to meet the bridegroom. In one of the Bible colleges where I studied, we have been taught that Matthew 25 verses 1 through 13, uh, the parable of the ten virgins, is a parable that is given to the church to warn the church to be ready for the rapture. You cannot really understand how these men, these professors who have studied so much, who have all these degrees and uh, you know PhDs and all that could mess up when it comes to such simple things in the Bible. It really amazes you when you think about it. In spite of all their experience, in spite of all their degrees, they mess up when it comes to comparing scripture with scripture and rightly dividing the word of truth. The reason for that of course is they depend more on their ability to uh, read Hebrew and Greek and they depend on the opinions of scholars more than on the words of God in the King James Bible, in the preserved pure word of God. That is the problem. So when you don't put your faith implicitly in this book, the King James Bible, you get into all sorts of mess when it comes to doctrine. All right, so it says they went forth to meet the bridegroom. Firstly, they are ten virgins. The church is never called virgins, plural. Now, the briders will tell you that every church is a bride. Every local church is a bride of Christ. Now, that is plain and simple false teaching. All right. I'm not saying these Baptist briders who teach that are heretics. I'm not saying they are not saved. 
No, they may be born again Christians, it doesn't matter. But at this particular doctrine, they are wrong. They are wrong to say that every local church is a bride of Christ. The Bible never says that. Look at, uh, in fact, the Bible never refers to the church as a woman. Not once. Israel is called a woman, but the church is never referred to as a woman. The church is referred to as a wife, as a bride, and as a chaste virgin, singular. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. Sorry, verse 2. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin, singular, to Christ. Chaste virgin. Do you see that? It's never virgins. It's never a woman. So, when you talk about the parable of the ten virgins, it has nothing to do with the church. In Matthew 25, you are in the tribulation and the church has already been caught up. Are you telling me that the Lord gives a warning to the church in the tribulation to get ready for the rapture? See how silly that is. But that's what they do, these people, when they deal with Matthew 25 verses 1 through 13. In verse 1, firstly, it says they went to meet the bridegroom. They didn't go to marry him. Jesus Christ, like uh, King Solomon, doesn't have many wives and concubines. He has just one bride, one single bride, and that is the church. And that bride is caught up before the tribulation begins. So who are these ten virgins? These ten virgins are uh, someone who go to meet the bridegroom. We know the, the, uh, the rest of the parable. Five of them are wise, five of them are foolish. What happens to the five that are wise? It's, uh, wise. it says, uh, At midnight there were six, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Midnight. If this tribulation period is looked at as a night time, then it will have four watches. The, uh, the